Our next speaker is Dr. Jim Harding. Uh, he, I like to say he wrote the book on Michigan herbs. So he has a lot of great books out if you haven't checked them out. Um, a lot of the books are Michigan snakes, Michigan turtles and lizards, Michigan frogs, toads and salamanders. Uh, Dr. Harding is very knowledgeable, uh, but he's going to talk today about a long-term study on wood turtles, implications for management and recovery. So thank good, you, good. Jim, for joining us today. I am gonna talk about the wood turtle. Uh, I marked my first wood turtle in 1969, beginning a very long-term study, which uh, in theory anyway, extends to the present day. Uh, COVID certainly interrupted this past year's uh, work. Um, my, my mom, who's 98 years old, by the way, fi found this old picture of me when I was, what, maybe five years old, four or five years old, releasing a baby wood turtle into the river and watching it walk into the river uh, up north when we were on vacation one time. So apparently, I've been working on wood turtles a lot longer than that. Um, and I want to say that it's it's certainly not just been me, uh, starting with my parents who had their doubts but uh, uh, never discouraged me from my herpetological interests. But uh, I, I certainly have not worked alone. Uh, I've had many, many great friends and colleagues work with me, uh, helping me collect data. Uh, Pete Wilson. Uh, is a standout uh, fine herpetologist, not a professional herpetologist, but a fine herpetologist. Uh, and here's Dave. Dave didn't want you to see him, but he's here. Here he is with a big smile. Dave Mifsud uh, has also been uh, instrumental in uh, keeping this going. Um, I have to also mention my mentor uh, at MSU, Dr. J. Allen Holman, who is uh, since passed, but uh, much missed, and uh, he had a lot of influence on my career, a lot of encouragement. Uh, my family uh, has been terrific, as my wife Shirley uh, has helped uh, in the field. She's braved the mosquitoes up north and the black flies to, to help me out. Uh, my daughters, uh, Alyssa and, and Laura, uh, started very young, and they, they learned the trade very quickly, and have done a good job with me too. Um, so, uh, so anyway, no, nobody works in a vacuum. You, you need other people with you. Um, my study started out and, and basically still is a, a, a basic mark recapture study, uh, you know, taking as much data as we can. Uh, when I study, started the formal study in 1969, not a lot of work had been done on wood turtles. Very little was known about them. So almost, it was an open-ended study because almost anything I uh, could find uh, was new. Uh, so that, you know, it was, uh, it was uh, pretty wide open. But anyway, let me just introduce this animal. Um, if you're not familiar with it, the wood turtle glyptemis and sculpta uh, is a semi-terrestrial sort of semi-aquatic uh, species, uh, which have fairly limited range, uh, extending from New England uh, and southern uh, Quebec and Ontario up through uh, the uh, upper Great Lakes, uh, Michigan, through uh, northern Michigan and uh, uh, the UP into Wisconsin and Minnesota and down into Iowa. Uh, so they're a uh, uh, fairly limited range. Uh, you can see the basic field marks there. There's no use uh, you know, going through what you can see in the picture. Uh, I wanted to find out especially as much as I could about their reproduction, about their life history, uh, about recruitment into the population. Uh, but, but again, almost anything that I would find in those early days was, uh, was, uh, was of interest. Uh, this is an aerial view of uh, what I would consider good wood turtle habitat. You can see all of the things that a wood turtle needs to survive is in this picture. Uh, you can see the river in the foreground. Uh, you can see it winding around. You can see the point bars uh, with their open sand. You can see the areas that would flood across those points. Uh, 
which keeps the forest from uh, in, uh, closing in and, and uh, leaving lots of open areas for them to feed. Uh, they have to have open sunny spots to nest and they, that those sandy areas uh, work very well for that. Uh, they basically, you can see also a horseshoe shaped slough in the background, uh, and uh, they generally do not inhabit that. They, they like moving water. They very rarely enter still water. Here's a, uh, a wood turtle stream showing us some nice alder uh, and other shrub development along the, the uh, uh, edge where they uh, feed. and. Uh, you know, they find a lot of food up there in these areas. Another standard habitat and, and a wood turtle basking. My friends in the east are always surprised to find that our wood turtles are basically river log bask, baskers, uh, like a, a map turtle or, uh, you know, like a soft shell turtle. They, uh, in, the, uh, in, New England, in the New England area, they basically inhabit smaller streams and so they don't see them like this. But again, in that photograph at the top, you can see the, the uh, point bar. You can see the open sand that they could use for nesting. You can see the grassy area uh, where they can loaf and they can feed and, uh, and uh, some shrub development. Uh, wood turtles are uh, omnivorous uh, species. They're not particularly fussy about what they eat. They'll eat plants. They'll eat... Uh, uh, insects, they'll eat berries, they'll eat carrion. Uh, they have a very interesting way of catching earthworms by thumping the ground with their feet and their plastra, the bottom shell, and uh, it actually does bring up earthworms, uh, which uh, allows them to uh, uh, feed on earthworms that would otherwise be inaccessible. Uh, because they feed, they stay near the water, but they feed on land that probably reduces competition with species like the northern map turtle, uh, with which they overlap in, uh, in northern Michigan. Now, uh, Dave brought up this point, uh, which I appreciate. Uh, the, and this is something that I, I, I tell my students or, uh, at MSU. Uh, I, I am newly retired, but I, I would always say that if you forget everything else in herpetology class, remember this one thing. Uh, the most important thing to remember about turtles is not that they can live very long lives, is that they must live very long lives. And we, we found this out, this was a, a discovery made in the late 20th century, uh, largely because of the work of Justin Congdon and his colleagues. This is a, an early view of Justin and along with some friends and snapping turtles. And he did a lot of work at the E.S. George Reserve near Pinckney, which belongs to the University of Michigan. And he studied Blanding's turtles, primarily also snapping turtles and painted turtles. This is a Blanding's turtle. And uh, I'm not going to show you too much in the way of technological grafting, but, uh, uh, graphing, but this is uh, from Justin's uh, big publication on Blanding's turtles. And all you need to get out of this chart is the zero zero line at the top is where the population reaches stability. That is, you've got enough survivorship that the population will remain stable. If you want a growing population, you go above the zero zero line. And you can see that adult survivorship has to reach about 98%, 97 to 98% per year uh, in order to maintain stability. That is, you can't lose more than about 2% of your mature adults each year and expect the population to remain stable. Likewise, with uh, this is just nest survivorship. Now, we, I think most herpetologists are aware that uh, nest survivorship in turtles is extremely low, even under normal average natural conditions. But you can see that uh, you've got to have at least uh, you know, about 30% of your nests surviving uh, to produce hatchlings in order to reach population stability. And the, uh, by the way, the nest, the uh, juvenile survivorship would cross the line at about 75%, 70 to 75%. So at any rate, you can't, you know, you have to have, you can lose a lot of nests 
and still have stability, but you do have to have some recruitment. Uh, even old, old turtles don't last forever. Now, why wood turtles have basically been declining in the state? I can't give you precise numbers, but certainly uh, there are far fewer of them now than in 1969 when I began my studies. Uh, probably the biggest factor in my study site was raccoons uh, destroying nests. Uh, they became more and more common as my study progressed, uh, and they went from rare to overabundant. And, uh, and from the last, about the last three decades, they have accounted for 100% of all the nests laid. More on that later. Another uh, thing affecting wood turtles, and it did affect my study site, is purposeful and incidental collecting. Uh, purposeful for the the pet trade, uh, you know, and the, uh, the wood turtle is known as an intelligent animal that makes a good pet. Sadly, that's true. It, it does, but we don't want you to collect them as pets, obviously. Uh, but you can imagine that removing this number of adult animals from any population is like a, it's a catastrophe. It, they cannot, you, they do not breed fast enough to allow any type of commercial exploitation. Uh, another maybe minor but also disturbing sense of loss is just the wanton vandalism, just shooting them for no particular reason, uh, except that they make a handy target, I guess. Um, here's a couple of sad, uh, one didn't make it. This one was, uh, the one on the right was hit by a bullet at the side, it split the shell, but turtles are tough animals and it did survive. Stream bank uh, stabilization uh, has occurred in Northern Michigan and uh, it, it is a big problem. Uh, uh, trout don't like sand. Uh, so in many of the trout streams up north uh, or even some warm water streams, uh, the uh, uh, fisheries biologists uh, uh, would uh, stabilize the, uh, the sand banks with rock work and whatnot, which basically makes the uh, the former nesting site no longer usable. Road mortality, of course, here's a snapping turtle and a Blanding's turtle. I, uh, the only picture I had of a road killed wood turtle is so gory, I didn't want to show it to you. Uh, but anyway, uh, road mortality where roads do crisscross or go run along rivers in the north uh, are a source of mortality. Now, how do we mitigate the threats to uh, the wood turtle? Uh, it is protected by law pretty much range wide now. In other words, if you see a wood turtle, a wild caught wood turtle for sale in the pet trade, it's probably almost certainly illegal or legally taken. Um, uh, you can still buy captive bred animals legally, but uh, wild caught animals are illegal. Uh, raccoon populations and other meso predators. Um, are a big problem in many areas, raccoons in particular, very difficult to control. You could, you could talk to Dave Missett about efforts to control raccoons and how you, know, you, can, you can remove hundreds of animals from a site and if you have two or three left, they'll, they'll still get all the turtle eggs. Uh, so how do we increase turtle populations? Uh, first of all, you have to obviously mitigate the threats that caused the decline in the first place. But what we want to do is increase recruitment uh, if, if we've already lost a lot of adults. Uh, now, here's this is Pete Wilson, by the way, uh, helping to excavate some eggs of wood turtles. Uh, there are ways of protecting turtle nests that don't require collection. Uh, you can put a big screen box over the nest, for example, but you have to have complete control over your site in order to do that. Uh, a couple of times I tried boxing site, uh, wood turtle nests and they're vandalized almost immediately. So unless you have control over a site, uh, you know, you might as well just collect the eggs and hatch them, uh, which we have done. Uh, wood turtles are, as species go, they're fairly easy to hatch. Um, they don't have temperature sex determination. That is, you can incubate them at almost any temperature and supposedly get a mixture of males and females. Um, 
many turtles have temperature sex determination, whereas, you know, if you incubate them really warm, they're all girls. If you incubate them on the cool side, they're boys. So uh, that goes for like painted turtles and spotted turtles and whatnot. So you get a bunch of hatchlings. And uh, we can, you know, we've gotten them past a very serious uh, part of their life cycle. We, we've at least gotten them past the egg stage to the hatchling stage. And uh, we can release them, take them and, and, and just put them into the habitat, which we've done. We, I, I pick the sites for release by, on the basis of where I used to find hatchlings and juveniles in the early parts of my study when there was still some natural recruitment going on. Uh, so you put them out there and you feel really bad because you, you, you know that these little things are, we used to call them raccoon M&Ms, which is basically what they are. Uh, and, uh, but some of them do survive. And, um, you know, we, we assume that uh, a lot of them would be lost. Uh, the the uh, mortality rate on hatchlings is quite high. Uh, but um, uh, that at any rate, some of them will survive. Uh, we also assume that, uh, however, that getting them bigger might get them past some of the possible predators. Uh, a raccoon will eat any size wood turtle, it doesn't matter to them, but, but once you get them past the hatchling stage, maybe fish won't eat them, for example. So, uh, you know, so the idea is to head start them so that they get some growth on them. Um, baby wood turtles are pretty easy to raise. Uh, it doesn't take much. They grow fast. They soon learn the routine and they, they turn turtle pellets into, into turtle pretty quickly. But the one big problem is that they uh, start to eat each other if you try to keep them together. So you can start out with uh, 10 baby wood turtles in a big bin and pretty quickly you end up in, with one wood turtle per bin in lots of little bins. And by the way, this, I should mention this uh, photo is from the John Ball Zoo, uh, who was helping me do a lot of head starting of wood turtles. And I uh, uh, owe them a great uh, amount of thanks for, uh, for all the assistance that they gave me. Jim, we also love the John Ball Zoo at the Institute. They're head starting our Eastern box turtles, but I'm also oh, yes, letting you yes. know uh, you've got about five more minutes before we'll take questions. Okay, we'll pick up the pace. <laughs> anyway, uh, in captivity, you can get about uh, three years growth in about 10 to 11 months, uh, and then you can uh, release them. Um, and this makes you feel a little better. They do look a little bit bigger, not quite as few, you know, at least a robin can't eat that, whereas a, a hatchling wood turtle or you know, even a robin or a blue jay can eat it. Uh, so here we are, here I am. Uh, gloriously uh, releasing some uh, older wood turtles uh, into the habitat. Now we have gotten some returns. Uh, the first, you know, some of the earliest returns were animals that I had actually released as hatchlings. Uh, and uh, we, we notched the hatchlings and some, you know, if, if the shell isn't too badly worn on the edges, you can still see uh, the notches. Um, and you know that that animal is released as a hatchling. And this is a nesting female uh, uh, finishing up a nest. Uh, we have also recaptured some head started animals. So we know that they do survive. Uh, I can't say that we have enough to, to really, you know, put together a statistical proof of uh, efficacy, but, but we know they do survive. Uh, we, we are still working on that part. Uh, but, uh, you know, we are finding them. I think we found uh, maybe uh, 20 or so had started wood turtles and maybe as many uh, hatchlings that we released. Uh, I think probably hedging your bets and releasing both hatchlings and uh, head started uh, uh, animals are, are, is probably a good idea. Now, uh, I'll just really quickly mention uh, we are doing what is called a, in the, re, the turtle head starting biz, uh, we are doing what's called a hard release. That is, we just take them from their bins or from their, from their nests and put them right into the environment. And it does seem to work. With some species, they have done what we call soft release. 
uh, for tortoises, especially some of the tortoises, the desert tortoise and the Burmese star tortoise uh, over in Myanmar, uh, what they do is they take the head started animals and put them in a controlled pen, a large pen, so the outdoors, so they can get used to feeding in the wild, but still uh, get watched and you know can be can be fed. Uh, and then they simply open the gates and let them wander off, uh, and uh, that really helps with some of these trickier species. Uh, the trade-offs and head starting takes time. Uh, you have to set up the logistics for head starting them. You have to have some funding for that. Uh, and uh, is, is it, you have to decide, is it worthwhile compared to simply collecting and or protecting the eggs and releasing the hatchlings? And if you had to pin me down right now, I'd say the jury is still out, certainly in my study area. Now, what would be the most effective uh, conservation measure for wood turtles right now would be to reduce the raccoon population by far. Uh, wolves, uh, by the way, that's a DNR photo of a, of a puma or mountain lion on, on, on the right there uh, in the UP. Uh, there are a few up there, we don't know why. Uh, the wolves they tried to bring back. And one little anecdote I'll leave you with here. Uh, a couple of years ago, Wolves moved into our study area, at least temporarily, uh, from farther north. And we noted very clearly that wherever there were wolf tracks along the edge of the sandbar, there was no raccoon nest predation. Wherever there were no wolves, there was 100% nest predation. So you mammologists, please bring back the wolf. Let's get them in down there. Let's, uh, let's, let's bring them back um, and, uh, and get uh, that raccoon population under control. Anyway, uh, my last slide, I think, uh, to secure the future of this turtle, we really have to uh, make sure that we're not burning the candle on both ends. We have to protect the old ones, make sure they're not collected, make sure they're not run over uh, while we might give them a bit of a hand with uh, recruitment. So uh, anyway, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to try. We definitely have questions. Thank you, Dr. Harding. That was a wonderful presentation. And you answered questions along the way, so it was great. By the way, uh, uh, Ellen, I want to mention I, I, I'm not a doctor. My oh, wife I apologize. Is, I'm not a doctor. I'm just, I, th I thank you for the field promotion, though. <laughs> well, Mr. Harding, then, thank you so much. <laughs> Um, so we do have a question from Facebook Live, um, and there is, are there any suggestions on how to balance habitats uh, or priorities to satisfy hunting and fishing rights with those of natural succession, such as bank stabilization versus wood turtle nesting sites? Yeah, I, I want to mention, uh, when, when I was talking about the bank stabilization, I, I should have mentioned that the fisheries biologists were very concerned about the effect on the turtles up in northern Michigan. And they did work with me. They, they said that they were under you know, obligation to stabilize these banks, uh, but they wanted to leave corridors and certain critical areas for the turtles to use. Uh, and uh, you know, so we and other people, uh, graduate students and whatnot, were given the, you know, uh, chore of going up and identifying the most critical spots for leaving these little corridors. So, so they are concerned, but it's still a problem. One thing I, I, the other thing I'll mention in regards to that question, when I showed you that aerial picture of the wood turtle habitat, it looked like pretty solid wilderness. That's not necessary. In fact, if, you, if you've ever seen wood turtle habitat in the east, you know, agricultural fields and even uh, suburban development can come right up within a few feet of the shoreline of a good wood turtle site. Uh, as long as you leave the wood turtles alone and don't run over them or collect them, they can tolerate quite a bit of disturbance. And uh, for example, if you wanted to do some clear cutting along that river up north, uh, you know, for the forest products industry, uh, as long as you do it at the right time of year, so you're not grinding up wood turtles while they're feeding, 
uh, if, if you do it the right way, you're actually creating wood turtle habitat because you're opening up areas that can be used for nesting. You're also creating berry thickets and things that the turtles can feed in. So the wood turtle is not an obligate wilderness species. It is a species that does pretty well in a mosaic human dominated environment. Again, as long as the turtles themselves are left alone. Speaking of turtles not being left alone, there's a lot of uh, interesting questions about their predators and the role of raccoons and uh, potentially wolves or other predators on them. Has, uh, Nick is asking, has there been any interest in creating predator calls to deter raccoons in nest sites? Uh, say that again, what? what has creating? there been creating, so basically, making wolf calls or something like that to deter any raccoons in, in I, I don't know. I, I don't know whether that would work or not. Uh, raccoons are pretty smart. You never, uh, never, anybody who's ever tried doing any kind of control uh, study on raccoons or control control on raccoons knows that they're extremely intelligent animals. I, I, I think they would probably need the odors of wolves and the, you know, uh, Maybe uh, salting it with the urine of wolves might might help. I don't know. Uh, that answers another question. So great. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's so that that might work. I don't know. Uh, turtles have lots of predators. The raccoon is singled out because they increased so dramatically during the late twentieth century uh, in Michigan. They they went. In fact, in uh, the old timers, when I first started my study, the old timers uh, that lived up there in the UP said that in the 1930s and 40s, if the trappers caught a raccoon, it was so rare that all the neighbors came over to see it. Uh, now, uh, when I, and when I first started marking, there was about one raccoon for every, you know, I mean, they about every four or five sandbars that I was checking for nesting, one of them was being predated for raccoons. By the late 1980s, all of them were being predated by raccoons. So the, uh, the raccoon population exponentially increased and, uh, and has created the biggest problem. Uh, yeah. As you can see again from my aerial photo, um, Habitat loss for wood turtles, uh, you know, most, most wild animals that are rare, you immediately peg habitat loss as the problem. I would say it's down the list a bit for wood turtles. For wood turtles, the biggest problem is probably human removal of the adults combined with lack of recruitment because of mesopredators like raccoons. Great points, very great points, Jim. I do have to cut you off now, unfortunately, because our time is up, but thank okay. you so much for sharing your wonderful knowledge. I know I learned a lot. Um, You're welcome. And thank you for being with us today. Thank, thank you for asking me. Yeah. yeah. Um,